Have a seat on your porcelain throne. It's time to talk some shit on the Powell Movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and it's finally warm in Seattle. And while I want to say I'm psyched, to be honest, if my kid didn't have good friends here, I would be out of the city. It's turning into such a shithole. It used to be you'd avoid Seattle because of the rain. But now I recommend avoiding the city as there are people smoking fentanyl on city buses daily, tourists and business people being attacked in broad daylight on the streets, and the police don't do shit about anything. The good news is I never see cops anymore when I'm driving, so I haven't had any tickets. The bad news is I never see cops anymore ever and we need them. It's so screwed up and we're the city that said defund the police and look, we got exactly what we asked for and we're pretty much screwed. If you're smart, don't visit this city. Why am I telling you this? I have no idea. I think the only reason I went on this rant is because my life is pretty calm right now, which is nice for a change. I have nothing good or bad to share with you, and I'll call that a win. Actually, I do have something good to share with you, something great. It's part two with Ted Ligety, and this week, Ted and I don't talk about being bullied or anything like that. We talk about Ted's greatness, and truly, he's one of the greatest skiers of our time. Before we get into it, I want you to tell a friend about the show and rate me wherever you listen. It really does help the podcast grow. So does sharing on social media. So please do that for me as well. Finally, I want you to support the brands that make this show happen. They are Elon Skis, Rollerblade, Stanley, Best Day Brewing, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, and High Cascade Snowboard Camp. Now, it's time to talk with Ted Ligety. We finished off last time with money, and I'm going to start this one off with sponsors. And ski racing is one of those sports where big watch brands come into play. But I hear that instead of a Rolex deal, you like to get all nerdy with your Casio calculator watch. What's the story behind that? (laughs) For a long time, yeah, I was repping the Casio calculator watch. It was partially because it was like thin and could fit underneath my suit and like my arm guards. And partially because I just liked the look of it, but... I have a calculator on my watch now, but it's a Apple watch. So I guess I've evolved a little bit in, in that respect. <laughs> but it sounds like you were the guy who was crunching all the numbers right there on the calculator watch and letting people know their data. Were you into like the data and numbers around racing? Yeah, I was definitely like, into, yeah, that like nerdier side of sport. Like I had a friend growing up that had a calculator watch that would like calculate the penalties of this races on his watch i didn't get quite that in depth on my math (laughs) on my calculator watch but yeah i mean i was always like really into analyzing the sport i don't know how much the calculator watch really ate in that though okay (laughs) and then outside of ski sponsors another unique one was that you were on gopro and with them it sounds like you were the dude who was tinkering with all sorts of different types of mounts did any of your ideas for mounts become full-on gopro products they started making more of like the follow cam poles. I mean, for the first while, I was basically like taping a GoPro on the end of a broken gate, and that would be like our GoPro pole. So, okay, very unsophisticated. And then they quickly evolved. So, yeah, they've been a fun partner to work with over the years. I still work with them a lot. So, trying to create like cool race content was something I was always into doing, and I still love taking apart because. You really only see it between the gates, but you don't actually see some of the cooler parts of it are watching people train in a cool, different way than just like coaches or TV view styles. And if you put cameras on skis and just kind of put them in weird spots just to see if it works and gets a cool angle for you? Yeah, I did like a lot of with like a long narwhal pole, like so like off the top of your head going backwards and forwards. And we made like a backpack mount too, which worked great for slalom, but didn't really work for a GS because you'd like wrap the pole sticking off your back into the GS gate. And then I did some like ski attachments. Also like the ski attachments work great free skiing, but man, the vibration forces on a pair of race skis, no matter how much super glue you put in there with multiple points of contact, they all vibrate off eventually. (laughs) And then what about energy drinks? I would think they would be a big source of income for all top level athletes. And then looking at your sponsor list over the years, have you purposely stayed away from the category? No, not really, man. We talked to like Red Bull at some point, but at the end of the day, like I was with Coke for two of the big cycles and Putnam Investments, which is my headgear sponsor, was aggregately better too. So it just never really worked out. I think Red Bull 
especially like kind of more in my like beginning earlier years on World Cup where they didn't really pick up athletes, just wasn't that active in the space yet. In thinking about being active in the space and traveling the world to ski race, there are a ton of expenses for you. And probably one of the biggest expenses is your ski tech and tech support. Do you have to pay for your own tech or does a ski team take care of it or is your ski sponsor? How does that work out? So like the top people in the World Cup have a technician that is just for them and that's from the ski company. So like head Alex Martin, who is my technician for the last 13 years of my career, Austrian guy who's employed by head. And then I give him a cut of prize money too. So kind of like a caddy, you give him a cut of prize money, but then there, I guess a caddy is not necessarily employed by the club company, but yeah. So they're like with you every single day of training. And that racer technician relationship is one of the most integral in the sport because you're spending so much time with each other every single training session, but also like equipment is so crucial to like having that good communication link. They're kind of like your link to the factory in a lot of ways too on like product developments side of things and how to tune things exactly the right way or tinkering with your equipment is really important to so having like a close relationship where you can communicate well and all that is is really beneficial. Is he the one who's traveling with all of your skis? Like, I mean, do you travel with 15 pairs of skis and he's responsible for all of them? Yeah, he's responsible for all the skis. Uh, we went to New Zealand one year with 80 GS skis. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, in those instances when you're doing that, you just like ship them down in like a cargo like shipment. <laughs> but yeah, those years, like when we were testing a lot of skis, the first years, like the new rule change back in like 2012, we brought down 80 GS skis in New Zealand to try to figure out what worked. But normally on the World Cup circuit, are you traveling with like 15 pairs of skis? So when I was racing all events, so I was racing GS Super G slalom downhill. Oh man, we pro I probably had like 15 pairs of GS skis alone on hand at all times. And then I probably had like five Super Gs, five downhills, probably like 10 slalom skis kind of depended on where we were and what was working and what wasn't working. So yeah, we're probably traveling closer with like 30 plus skis on average, if not more. Are you with the tech when you're traveling? Like, are you guys always a shit show of like 20 ski bags and it's just like you're dripping sweat every time you're at the airport? You'd be shocked by how organized these guys are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, going through the airports is tough. Yeah, you have to like organize it well beforehand. I mean, if it's a lot of teams or we're coming into an airport with the whole team together, we're generally checking in like a different area because we have so much stuff. Yeah, it's it's a whole thing. I mean, generally, we're like checking our bags in the night before because we would just clog up the whole system if we were checking at the counter all together for a lot of the times. OK, so that's your skis. But every skier knows that your boots are the most important thing. I mean, I don't know on the World Cup level, but everybody travels with their boots and they're carrying them on. How about yourself? Do you carry boots with you or do you trust your tech with your boots as well? I would travel with like my GS race boots for the most part. It depended on like if you're traveling where you're going to be on the road for a long time and you had to send five because I had a pair of different pair of boots for every single race and then I'd have a backup pair just in case something happened. So I like, we'd ship and fly, like have those checked, but I'd always carry like the bare boots that I knew I was going to be racing on like two days later on myself. When you have all those backup boots, does that mean you have to break in like six pairs of boots every ski season? I use the same liner throughout all of them. So like I always was pulling the liner out of each one. So like the fit piece of it, which is the liner, was an important piece. And some boots, like a slalom boot generally for me was better, fresh, like newer. So it was a little livelier GS stuff. I actually had one of my coaches that I grew up racing with was the same size foot as me. And he would just go, when I get a new pair of GS boots, he'd go free skiing them. Okay. Um, so he was helping me break them in as well. Okay. And all of this kind of leads us up to the Torino Olympic Games. And I doubt that you're getting a lot of the press that the other U.S. skiers are getting just because you're so young and you have such a badass team at that point. But your results are undeniable. But you're the young kid on the team with Bodie and Darren. And does that make it a lot easier for you, knowing that the pressure's on all those dudes and most people don't even know you exist? Yeah, it's definitely coming in under the radar for the games in 2006. Especially like at that time, I mean, Bodie was on another level as far as like his name is sport, but also his level of skiing, especially like the year before. So he was obviously like taking up 
98% of the attention around ski racing. And then Darren Rolfs at the time was also having an unbelievable year too. So like those two were definitely the big favorites, even though like I was having a pretty good year. I was a young kid scoring, getting on the podium here and there, but deep, deep inside both those guys' shadow, which I think was just fine for entering the first games. The big combined event is on Valentine's Day. You have two time slalom runs, one downhill run. They're combined going into your third run or your second slalom run. I think it's the last run of the event. You're guaranteed a medal. When you head into the corral and you see your score, is there a way to describe that feeling knowing that you're the young kid and you're guaranteed at least a bronze medal at the Olympics? Yeah, it's kind of funny. So like after the downhill run, I was like way out of it. I was in like 30 something place way off the downhill skiers, way off Bodie. But I was actually pretty close to a lot of the slalom skiers. So like going to the slalom runs, I had zero pressure. And I just like fully let loose on the course. That first slalom run went from being like 30 something place to being in third place. And I remember like sitting in the workout room between runs, like on the spin bike and just kind of thinking to myself, holy shit, like what if I won a medal at the Olympics? Oh my God, like what would my friends who are like racing in college think about that? And I started getting (laughs) super nervous and then, I was just like, okay, I just have to like forget about that. Like just go ski and whatever happens, happens. Act like you have nothing to lose, which I didn't. So I was able to like push that on my mind, had another unbelievable slalom run, came down, winning by over a second with two racers left, so guaranteed a medal. And then just nervously watching the next two guys not being able to beat it. And to like see first place at the end of the race was shocking. Two of my teammates, Scott McCartney and Steve Nyman, came over and like tackled me to the ground and put me on their shoulders. And I was just in such shock and disbelief at the whole situation. My parents actually were there as well. So I saw them like five minutes later in tears. And that's kind of, I guess, when it more hit me about the emotional side of that and what I'd just done. It was just surreal. That one, especially, I still pinch myself when I think back and describe it. When you think about the emotional side, is there a moment where you lose it and just tears start welling up in your eyes and you just can't even control that? I guess it was like a little bit of shell shock and emotion. It was a very out of body foreign experience. Like thinking that you just accomplished this dream from when you were, you know, a 10 year old kid and you're only 21 and you're just starting on your career. It was a bizarre feeling in that regard, just like kind of out of body. So I wouldn't say I have broke down uncontrollably crying, but like I remember when I was in the metal stand the next night in Torino and the national anthem was playing, my parents were on the front row. And so I could see them. And I just like remember looking down at them from the podium and just like shaking my head in disbelief and just wetness in my eyes, but also just like at the same time, just like I couldn't believe the situation. Yeah, I would think everything has to be a total blur of what's going on. And is there a moment like three weeks later where it all finally sets in? I mean, is that what it takes is like you're in the whirlwind of the Olympics, then you go through the media corral of 24 hours of insanity, and it takes like a week to get home and sit down and realize, holy shit, I'm an Olympic gold medalist, and it sets in? Maybe it's like more in the spring, I guess. (laughs) Right after the Olympics, we were going back straight to the World Cup. So it wasn't like a big pause in that game. They didn't go back to the U.S. and do some big media circus. I just went straight back into World Cup, we were in Korea the next week in Japan, the next week, and like, it was just uh, still in the trudge of it. So yeah, I don't think it really hit me until I was back home in Park City and just seeing my friends and all that. But like I said, it's still that one. I still like get goosebumps saying about it. It's still a weird foreign experience just because, you know, I thought I knew I had chances, but it was not an expectation. That's for sure. Yeah, you don't go into that Olympics thinking you're going to win a medal or an Olympic gold medal. And then when it all comes together, it's totally mind blowing. And then, like you said, you go back on the World Cup tour, so there isn't that media barrage like a lot of people have at the Olympics. Does that all happen when you come back in the spring? Is that when you're doing like Letterman and different talk shows and all that? And do you have a media person that's arranging all that for you? We did that stuff, yeah, more right right when the race season finished, like a month or so after the Games, which at that point, like the world has kind of moved on from the Olympics to March Madness or whatever else the next thing is, so... Yeah, the media tour for me at that point was crazy. But yeah, it wasn't the same as if I'd gone home right afterwards. And the ski team was kind of arranging all the media stuff. I mean, I had an agent as well. We are doing some stuff on the side there. But for the most part, it was all kind of conducted through the ski team. And then when you think about, and this can be throughout the breadth of your career, but what are the once-in-a-lifetime opportunities that you get when you win an Olympic gold? 
I mean, are you able to see your favorite bands from the wings of the stage? Do you get crazy experiences like that? Oh, man, I'm trying to think of like what the craziest experience. I guess like a couple years later, I went to the F1 in Monaco and had like full access. I was there with some friends. We were with Red Bull in the pits during that whole thing was pretty fun pretty un- unreal to see it at that level and be like taking the boat out to the pits with the drivers and that was pretty next level I'm trying to think of like other stuff i mean have you been in a nascar i've flown an f-16 so that's probably like the true highlight actually getting f-16 ride was the coolest experience ever i mean those planes are unreal no nascar race I'm trying to think of like what other cool have you been on pretty baller private jets i've had some pj time some here and there but that was not a way of travel I was ever accustomed to. <laughs> All right. And then what's your biggest starstruck moment? Because I'm sure you've met a lot of famous people and some have to have blown your mind. I mean, at the ESPYs that year, at like one of the pre-parties, hanging out with like Tom Brady, getting a drink next to LeBron James. LeBron had his like bouncer crew. So I didn't end up really talking to him, but talked to Tom Brady for a little while and these huge sports stars that, you know, I'd idolized. Yeah, it was really cool. Oh, the perks of winning the Olympic gold. Well, over the (laughs) next four years, you continue to tear up the World Cup circuit. But after the Olympics is when you add entrepreneur to your resume. And talk about the Slytech relationship and how that relationship becomes the catalyst for Shred Optics. Yeah, so my first year on the U.S. ski team, we're at a fifth race in Italy, kind of in between World Cups. And a teammate of mine, Jimmy Crockin, who's like going to engineering school, him and I met this guy at the ski race who this guy like is at the finish line of this like race in Italy. And he had these carbon fiber shin guards, which at the time, everything was just plastic. And we're like, those things are rad. And we started talking to him. He's like, oh yeah, like I'm done racing. I'm just an engineer. I'm like having fun racing here and there on the side. But I made these in my garage. I'm like, oh, that's rad. Can you make us a pair? And he did. So he started prototyping some shin guards and then arm guards, which at the time that was the first protective arm guard out there in the world that was outside your suit. And so we we're just tinkering with this guy, Carlo, on equipment on chain guards and arm guards and stuff. And that's how Carlo and I became friends. And then he started Sly Tech through that. And then after the Olympics in 2006, I was not happy. I didn't like all like the very, especially like German oriented race brands out there. Like they work for racing, but like I never get caught dead free skiing with my buddies at Snowboard or something with them. So I definitely felt like there was a need for something that had like the feel of view of a race goggle, but also had the look and feel and aesthetics and was fun, like a more free ride oriented goggle. So that was the idea. We're on a mountain bike ride. We're riding the Crest Trail in Park City. And I was talking to him about this idea. And he's like, oh, actually I actually know where a goggle manufacturer is. And we like handshake. Three months later, he's like, I have a prototype. and sends me a prototype. We just started tinkering from there. And that's how it was born. I mean, it's just like two young guys, an engineer and an athlete, tinkering, playing with it. Like no business plan. Just like both of us jumped in head first. And it's purely for a market need. It's like all this race stuff is for nerds and you want to make race stuff for cool racers. That's kind of the idea is we're going to make shit that looks cool. And it's also a way to market you because if you look at everything behind Ted Ligety at that point, it's like, They're marketing the shit out of Bodie Miller. They're marketing Darren pretty well. But when you think about Ted, it's just Ted and there's no real marketing machine behind them. And it seems like with Shred, you're able to kind of go with flashy colors and do some stuff that makes you stand out more so than you would stand out with any other brand. Did that have anything to do with it at all? A little bit. I mean, I've always been like a tinker, a little bit like more engineering minded, but also entrepreneurial in the sense of just like wanting to have a business. And honestly, I, I did think about like, I was 21, but I was like, after ski racing, I want to stay in the ski industry, but like, what would be like the best path? It's like owning a company in this world would be like the coolest path. So I A, see this need now and like, why not start it while I'm racing? So that was, I guess, kind of the, the thought process, which is crazy to think that that's what I was thinking about when I was 21 years old, I guess, in, in that sense. But yeah, I mean, I guess I had like kind of a marketing, I guess, ish eye and thoughts on it and like, yeah, I wanted something to be like a little bit wilder and something that would stand out. So that was definitely part of the thought process. I mean, our original colors with Shred was neon pink, neon green, neon blue, and white. We didn't have a black, which black is the number one selling goggle out there. So the whole idea was every single pair you'd see across the valley, be able to tell somebody was wearing Shred. So that was kind of our impetus from the beginning. 
It's time for my first sponsor break, and I'm excited to add High Cascade Snowboard Camp to the mix. If you really consider yourself a great parent, you'll give the gift of summer snowboarding to your kid. This is your excuse to get the kids out of your hair and onto the Timberline Glacier at Mount Hood. Instead of having to plan the day for your kids, they'll have a plan of hot lapping top to bottom chairlift rides on real snow. They'll be getting expert coaching and making memories that are going to last a lifetime. If you want your kid to love you, you'll send him or her to Arbor Snowboard's signature session. The dates are July 23rd to July 29th, and your kid will learn to shred from pros like Eric Leon, Mary Rand, Hayden Tyler, Steffi Luxton, Mike Lydell, and Estelle Pensaro. It really is a life-changing experience that your kid will thank you for forever. And if you don't want to hook your kid up or you don't have a kid, don't forget about the adult camp. It's the perfect mix of expert coaching and adult activities. So treat yourself and come be a kid again this summer at High Cascade Snowboard Camp. You can find all about the kids and adult camps over at highcascade.com. Next up, it's Best Day Brewing. If you haven't tried what critics and myself are calling the best N.A. beer on the planet, you are missing out. Look, I'm not going to quit drinking beer completely, and I'm not asking you to do that. But we all have times where we want an ice-cold beer, but we don't want something that's going to slow us down. You know, when you have to take your kid places, driving to the mountain, there's all kinds of reasons why you don't need to be slowed down in this life. And Best Day is crafted for us doers out there. The skiers, the snowboarders, the bikers, the skaters, the hikers. You know, people like us. And they support cool things like this podcast, Michelle Parker, Darren Ralphs, and they are all over the pickleball scene. So if you play that, know that Best Day's supporting you. And while all that stuff is cool, I drink Best Day for the flavor. I've been loving their hazy IPA and their Kolsch lately. It tastes just as good as its alcoholic cousins without all the calories. I mean, these are both under 70 calories. One's like 53. So next time you're at the store, pick up the N.A. beer that supports our kind of people and will make you have your best day ever. I'm talking about Best Day Brewing. To find out more about the brand, the events, and the flavors, head on over to bestdaybrewing.com. My final sponsor this round is Elan Skis. And if you haven't had a chance to ski on one of the Ripsticks models, you're not skiing as well as you possibly can. I mean, there's a reason why Elan's been building a cult following over the past couple years in the States. And it's because their skis are lively, playful, fun, all while remaining stable at speed. Ask anyone you see you skiing on an Elan, and they'll tell you right away, the skis are making them a better skier. And that's important. When you're buying a high-performance product, the hope is that it's going to make you perform better. And Elan does that every time. And Elan has some new models in the pipeline that are going to show a whole new generation how fun skiing can be when you're on an Elan. On top of that, they have a state-of-the-art factory that's powered by renewable energy provided by solar panels. And 70% of the materials they use to build their skis are sourced within 250 miles of their factory or less. To find out more about Elan, head on over to elanskis.com. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. Starting something so young is definitely ahead of the curve. And it makes you think about a lot of things that you didn't have to think about, like production, planning, startup capital, all the different things behind a business that go into it. But you also now need to think about things on the big stage of the Olympics. Rule 40, I think, was the rule. I can't remember if it was Rule 40 or had a different name, but it was a big deal back then. Brands and athletes were almost handcuffed with what they could do marketing-wise. That was frustrating for everyone involved. Did that impact Shred going into the games? Yeah, if you think about the impact shred wise, I mean, obviously, like at the Olympics, the logos have to be smaller than your general production runs. So for a small company, like that was a big deal for us, like making straps that conform to the Olympic rules was a big headache. So that was something. But then also, if you look at like our Olympic strap, one of the years it said censored on it, we were like trying to like push the boundaries on like bringing attention to that. It's loosened up a little bit. But yeah, the whole rule 40 thing in the Olympics is just a huge cabal. I mean, to you're just getting all these athletes that 90% of them barely make a living. And then you limit their ability to make money during the games to, it's a pretty messed up system to abide by. So things have loosened up a little bit there, but it's a tough deal because yeah, if you get in on the five sponsors that are the Cokes, McDonald's, the Hilton's, the pg and if you get in a couple of those, like things are great, but like if your sponsors aren't those, then they can't use you. And that really kind of hinders your value to a lot of these sponsors, which is unfortunate. I know being at a brand during a few different Olympic Games sponsoring athletes and we had no affiliation with the Games, it was pretty much like on social media, you're almost shutting that athlete's page down and everything around that athlete is lights out because they can't be seen for three weeks. It's almost like you're hurting their career by making them an Olympian, unfortunately. 
at some point we kind of sat down and it's like, well, do we want to pay for this Olympian next year? Because we're not really going to be able to market them during the Olympics when that's pretty important. And it really just kind of screwed all the athletes. It sounds like you said that the rules are kind of relaxing a little bit. But did you ever get in any trouble for logo size or placement or anything related to your sponsors? No, n- never directly. And I mean, we like pushed the boundaries of the rules and tested the bounds, but never like went over the line and, and like got infractions. I mean, the penalties, the Olympics were pretty harsh. I don't know if they'd ever disqualify somebody for a logo infringement, but they could disqualify you. So the fact that you could, it would be pretty obnoxious to risk that. So we pushed the bounds, but we weren't trying to draw the attention to the brand in whatever ways we could, but never really crossed the line just because the idea of what the punishment could be would be pretty disastrous. Yep. And so at this point in your career, your life's work is paying off. You've got this brand, you're a gold medalist ski racer. And the next big thing that's coming up is the Vancouver Olympic Games. And you're not a secret anymore. Do you feel a ton more pressure this time around? And how does that impact you? Yeah, entering the 2010 Games was a totally different scenario than it was in 2006. 2006, I was having a great year. I've been on the podium and everything, but it was really under the radar. Nobody's expecting anything. Going to the 2010 Games, I won the GS title the year before. I was third in the World Championships the year before. I was first in the world in Giant Slalom. I was like fifth in the world in Super G, top 10 in the world in Slalom, one of the best in the world in combined. So I was like, I was a legitimate contender for three medals there. And that was like, honestly, like, was my goal was to try to get three medals. And first event that I raced was the Super G. And actually, I was like right on pace, but just made one big mistake. Ended up like 15th without that mistake would have been in the running for a medal. And then the combined went off and I was still there. Like I won the Psalm run, ended up fifth. So just off the podium. And then in giant Psalm that was left with no medals at that point and thinking that was my real only chance. And I got so far inside my own head, like being first in the world, knowing I had a good chance if I skied normal. I just overcalculated. I thought about every single turn the whole way down and ended up ninth place. I mean, I was like six after first run thinking it was okay, like a couple of tens off a of podium and then just totally choked. I mean, that was like purely what happened. Just thought about every single piece of it, not letting myself flow at all. That was a big lesson for me. So when people talk about the mental aspect of the sport, that was the mental aspect totally screwing you there. Like you had it all like ability wise, ski wise, you've got everything you possibly need, but your head is just not right for that. Yeah, I think ski racing, I mean, of course, I'm extremely biased in this regard, but I think it's the hardest mental sport out there because the opportunity is so small. You have to nail your mental approach in this, you know, two minute window. You know, you only get into the course 30 seconds down mentally, then you're out of the course. Or if you're a little bit off mentally, you can be two seconds out. Or if you make a mistake, you can end your season or even end your career. Like the consequences are really high as well. There's a lot of sports out there that are mentally tough. I think of like golf, obviously, it's a mental endurance game, but you can shank a lot of shots and still win tournaments in golf, or you can double fall off a lot of tennis matches or whatever it is. You can miss those shots in ski racing. You miss one of those shots and it's done. Like your day is done or you're really slow or your season's done. So I think that side of sport is really hard. It's hard to like nail letting yourself go, but also like finding that balance is really difficult in the sport. And so, yes, definitely a lot of people struggle with it and some people nail and are good all the time, but it's a struggle. That's also why you see at the Olympics, like more often than not at the Olympics, the favorites don't win just because it's a one day race, the pressure, the conditions are sometimes a little bit different. It's not like your normal race arena. So yeah, funny things happen at the Olympics. Leading up to that Olympics, you had only known success. You'd known a gold medal at your first Olympic Games. When you aren't able to put it all together in Vancouver and you miss out on the medal, what are the emotions for you? I was mad at myself. Yeah, I was very disappointed, super mad. Like I ended up winning the GS Globe that year, but it was like still a failure of the year. It's like think about a season where you win a Globe, which is like the accomplishments of an entire season of consistency, but walking away with a Globe and no medal. Yeah, I felt like I had really failed that season. That was a good lesson to like realize like, hey, like, you can't play this tactical game. You just have to go out there and ski and put yourself in the right mind. And that's what led to be far more successful in the years after. Like I learned the lesson from like trying to play that game too tightly. I just need to go out there and ski. 
So was it almost like you weren't skiing as aggressively as you should be skiing? You were just in your head and that kept you from being as aggressive as you usually are? Yeah, especially in that like singular race at the Olympics and the GS. I was way too far in my own head. But I would even say like a lot of races on the World Cup, I was kind of like trying to calculate, trying to be like too tactical and think about what the position is. Do I want to be in like first or fifth place after first run or whatever it is? Like, no, you should just be as fast as possible because maybe you can get a gap or you never know what the conditions are going to be. So like I decided I was going to stop being tactical in that regard and just letting myself go and, and just ski hard. Of course, there's tactics you need in the race, but like only thinking about those in the one second before you actually have to make that adjustment, but not thinking about the whole way. Okay, I can see that. And then over the next couple of years, you earn your keep on the World Cup. Not as many podiums, but whatever. You also film with Warren Miller, and in your second year with them, they give you a choice, Greenland or Alaska. Had you skied Alaska yet at this point? The first time like filming with Warren Miller was in Alaska, and that was a huge eye-opening experience. I mean, I grew up like being a huge fan of the ski movies and watching you know all the big lines in Alaska, and that was definitely like something that I wanted to do. I loved like going out there and free skiing, like powder skiing, going ripping hard, fast turns down big bowls and hitting jumps and cliffs and all that stuff was something I absolutely loved. I had just as much of a passion for it as racing even though racing was kind of my main outlet. So to go up there and do that, it was a dream come true and a huge learning experience. I mean, I just remember sitting, actually like our first filming run, we were at the top of Spine Cell, which we were in the Chugach flying out of Alyeska. And Spine Cell is kind of like a notorious film zone. And Phil Meyer, who's a Red Bull athlete at the time, went down in front of me and I was just like standing on the ridge on the top and just watched as the whole ridge just slabbed off and he got zipped down to the bottom. Luckily, he was okay, like, blew out his airbag and was at the top of it and just like, oh, shit, like, what am I doing up here? These consequences are real. Like, I'm up here, I want to have a fun time, like, shoot some cool shots, but, like, my bread and butter is, like, in a race course. This is pretty gnarly, so very eye-opening experience, but, like, it's just wild. Like, you know, when you race, like, you have to know exactly where you're going, but you get to go side slip it, you know, when you go to Alaska do these big mountain lines like you stand at the top and it like looks like you're standing on your kitchen table and then all you see is like the floor below you and you're just like looking between your ski tips and like you see nothing but the bottom of the valley you know and like you have pictures on your phone you looked at like what it looks like below you but like it's really hard to know what's a 10 foot rock and what's a 50 foot rock (laughs) you know when you have those perspectives so being on a trip with a guy like Phil Meyer that first time was helpful to like kind of get that gauge of what everything was, but like all those things like self management, gauging how big stuff was, like finding your way confidently down the line was difficult. I mean, that was scary. I definitely took some big tumbles, was fine each of the times, but yeah, it was really fun, but it was scary. (laughs) So that first trip, it's not like you're a total fish out of water, but I'm sure you have that feeling a bunch of different times. The next trip with Warren Miller, you end up going to Greenland. And going there, they end up losing your skis. And I would think these are nightmare situations where you're traveling halfway around the world to film this segment and they lose your skis. But for you, you're a ski racer. So if you don't have skis and you don't get a segment filmed, no big deal, no harm, no foul, because that's not where you make your money. It's almost like fun for you. But when I think about losing skis and stuff like that, has that ever happened on the race side where they lose your shit and you're like, holy shit, my bread and butter is screwed because the airlines. I've been lucky in that regard that it's never happened. I've had to lose my clothing bag and I have to use somebody else's suit and long underwear and all that stuff, which is annoying, but not the same as I've always ended up having my skis and my race boots. So I've been lucky in that regard. There's definitely been some people that have had to go on everybody's other stuff and it generally doesn't pan out well. So yeah, on that Greenland trip, I spent an extra couple of days in Copenhagen waiting for my stuff. It all worked out. I mean, that was a cool trip. The skiing was not that gnarly also just because the conditions were kind of tough they hadn't had much snow so it was like six inches of really light powder on top of glacial ice so you can make some shots look cool but you weren't getting too gnarly although the risk factor if you did get hurt in greenland is a little bit crazy if you start thinking about the consequences in that regard and and what happens if you actually get really injured there you're there with michelle parker and mark abma And their lives are traveling across the world, regardless of what the snow conditions are, to film for the camera because that's how they get paid. For you, is it kind of just like a nice to have, like you're psyched to go on this trip and 
even though the conditions suck, it's like, fuck yeah, I'm filming with Warren Miller. It's definitely a trade on the top. Absolutely. Like it's not like a high consequence thing as far as like where I end up in my career, but like also like to go ski with Mark Adma and Michelle, they were also people I looked up to like watching films and like, man, they rip, like it's really cool. Like watching their skiing, especially in their zone. That's one of the things filming with GoPro and all these trips, like seeing these athletes that are in their zone, like obviously I'm a good skier and I can ski big lines, but not the same as these guys and girls. So it's really cool watching them in their zone. Like going on a GoPro trip with Travis Rice, you like see how fucking confident he is on stuff that you would like not even think about doing with just massive exposure. And like everybody else is puckered up watching it and he just doesn't know problem. You're like, oh man, like that is a very different skill set and that takes a lot of time and it's pretty amazing to be able to accomplish. So it's been really fun going on those trips with those people because you see them in their element. I mean, it's be like if they came, went to a race and went and ran the race after us or before us, like to see that challenge and confidence level. It's, yeah, it's, it's interesting seeing them, somebody like that in their element. And you really start to respect that different side of the sport. You see them in their element and what they're able to do. And it's different than your skill set and just going fast and being able to control that. So we know there's a difference in your skiing, although both things cross over a little bit, but we know that you crush Mark and Michelle when it comes to income. I mean, you probably make more than those two make combined in like half a year, but that's just the reality of a ski racer. With exposure, are Mark and Michelle just as recognizable as you in the U.S.? I don't know. I guess I'm not the person to say on that. I think in certain places they probably are more, in certain places they're not. I don't know. It's, it's different. I mean, there are different arenas and in ski racing, you're on TV internationally in front of a billion people almost every single weekend. So you're getting a lot of exposure that way, which is different than in the ski movies that happen once a year. And often your sponsors have to pay to actually get you in the movie. So it's just, it's like a different market. Like I said, when we were talking the other day, like I'm glad I was a racer because everything is very objective. You know, there's no subjectivity to who wins that day. You know, it's whoever's fastest in the day. So. I guess that's like that, like cut and dry side of things on the racing side, as far as, you know, the business of it. Marketability doesn't make you faster in racing or anywhere, really. It's just speed. So that's a big difference. But the big difference really with you and them is when you talk about Europe, because like you said, you're on TV every weekend. People see your face. Can you describe the level of fame you have over in Europe? In Austria and Switzerland, like in my heyday, yeah. It's funny because like scary things is good in the same point that you're like, in the field, you're in helmet and goggles, so, like, they know your name, but they're not necessarily recognizing you on the street. But, like, everywhere I'd go in Switzerland and Austria, like, people would stop or say hi. But it wasn't, like, over the top because you had to, like, be somewhat into the sport to recognize. If they, like, said my name someplace in, in Zurich, people would know what it was, but they wouldn't necessarily, like, stop me on a regular basis walking down the street in Zurich. Could you get a table at a restaurant just because of your name? Yeah, it was easy to like, get in places if you like called up and said, yeah, hey, it's Ted Ligeti, this and that. Like, yeah, that helped over in Europe for sure. But I guess I wasn't pulling that card that often. <laughs> Is it weird to get used to? Like every time you get off a plane in Europe, you come from the U.S. where people don't know you in the airport that much. And then you get off the plane in Europe and you can all of a sudden recognize people looking at you, like trying to figure out how they know you because you're familiar to them. <laughs> That's different for sure. I'm glad. Like I said, the like ski racing, you're in, in your goggles and helmet and not that recognizable. And I'm glad by and large, you can live as a normal person. I mean, it's definitely different in Europe. I mean, it's, it's cool to like be appreciated for your sport at that high level, but I was never somebody who is that comfortable being like recognized or in the spotlight or all that stuff. It's time for my second sponsor break. And if you haven't shopped at Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, you aren't only letting me down, you are missing out on the best shopping experience online or in person. Peter Glenn has all the brands, all the deals, and the best products from the world of ski, snowboard, inline, wakeboarding, and so much more. What I love about Peter Glenn is that they price match. If you find a product at a reputable dealer for a lower price, Peter Glenn will match that price. They also offer free shipping on orders of $50 or more, and it's always easy to return something at Peter Glenn if you don't like it. That's important, because if you get something that doesn't fit, you don't want to hassle returning it. And some retailers make it a hassle, not Peter Glenn. So next time you're in the market for anything outdoor-related, support the brand that makes this show happen and head on over to peterglenn.com. Next up, it's Rollerblade. 
Ski season is coming to a close, and if you're like me, your ski legs are really firing right now. If you're also like me, you sometimes slack in the summertime, and getting those ski legs back is so hard. I found a way to fix that problem. Inline skating. Not only is it fun, but it'll keep you in ski shape all year long, all while burning the same amount of calories that you would by running or biking. And if you're a runner, switch to inline. It's going to save your knees. And if you're a biker, save your bank account. Skates are a fraction of the cost of a bike, and they travel so much easier. And for everyone, Rollerblade has an award-winning skate-to-ski app that will get you in the best shape of your life for ski season. To find out more about the app and to find out more about all the amazing skates, head on over to rollerblade.com. My final sponsor is Stanley, the iconic Seattle brand that has been outfitting your adventures since 1913. For over 90 years, Stanley has been the right choice for the planet. And if you don't have a Stanley water bottle, it's time to rethink your drinking habits. I mean, it's 2023, and using single-use plastics are unacceptable these days. Good thing is, I'm going to make it easier than ever for you to get that water bottle, all of your camping and storage needs, and more. Yep, I'm going to save you 30% on all of your Stanley products. If I were you, I would pick up six of the pint glasses, which I use every single day, a water bottle, and a bunch of their food storage and camping stuff that you're going to need this summer. To get the deal, all you need to do is head on over to Stanley1913.com, go shopping, and when you check out, enter the code PMOVEMENT. That's all lowercase and no spaces, and you're going to save 30% on your order. It's a sweet deal that I hope you take advantage of. Those are my sponsors. Now it's time to jump back into the podcast. This is around the time you get on head skis, around 2011-ish. You had won gold medal on vocal, you were skiing well on Rozzy, but with heads really where you started your total domination... And Head has a stacked race program. What was the reasoning behind leaving Rossignol, first of all? Part of it was that, like, the year before Rossi, that was, like, that 2010 era, like, around the financial crisis. They went from being owned by Quicksilver to being independent again. They, like, basically slashed their marketing across the board. I mean, if you talk to any of their athletes at this time, they asked everybody to basically take a 50% cut, take it or leave it. And I had actually injured myself the year before. I tore my MCL and PCL the year before the Olympics in 2010. So like when they gave us that ultimatum, I was on crutches. I wasn't in a position to go test the market. So I just bit the bullet and did it. And then the next year, I knew I was going to go someplace else. And Head wasn't that established at that point. They had Didier Kush and Bodie Miller. But like their team beyond that was pretty limited. I mean, Lindsey Vaughn just switched the year before. But they weren't like this dominant powerhouse. But they were very committed to making the best stuff. I mean, their owner, Johan Elias, was like personally recruiting me and saying that like basically carte blanche on whatever you want to make ski-wise and all that. So the combination of like the economics of it, but also like the ability to take a larger role in in how stuff was made that you're racing on. Well, you're a tinkerer, so I can think that if they're going to give you some control or some ability to mess with the skis, that's got to be pretty important to you. And leading up to like the 2012-13 season, Fist has a rule change for GS, and they're reducing the illegal amount of side cut, and you're pissed. Can you describe the rule change and why you were so against it? Yeah, so the rule change was coming out, like Fist did this like they call it an empirical test. They like had the companies made some 35 meter skis and some 40 meter skis and to see what they thought would be safer. GS especially, even though GS wasn't necessarily a huge difference as far as injury wise, they thought it was maybe a little bit worse, you know, knee injury wise, but they targeted GS really as like where they're going to try to push the harshest rule changes. And they like had 12 racers ski for five days on these skis. That's obviously not a testing pool where you get a lot of empirical data on what's safer and what's not safer. So originally the rule was like 40 meter radius. Basically, Phil Mayer was skiing on skis with more radius than that in the 80s. Okay. And I had sent me some of the skis in New Zealand. So this is like a year and a half before the rule came into place. And I was like, these are fucking bullshit. This is not fun. It's not cool. And at the same time, we had the 35 meter radius skis there. At the time, those were brutal as well. And so I myself and a lot of athletes were pissed because like the athletes weren't even taking into account. Like the athletes that were testing them were like really low level racers, club level people, you know, not even Europa Cup or even higher level people. So like the test was like completely bullshit. They just rammed it through, no athlete input. And so, yeah, we were pissed because it was totally changing how fun the sport was, especially like at the beginning. 
without really having a lot of time to like test stuff. It was just so far outside of what the norm was, which was basically there were some radius rules and there's some height rules, but you could kind of engineer a ski that fit you. Now, basically, everybody's going to be skiing on more or less the same side cut. And so you're just figuring out ways to tinker with the equipment just outside that in a much more narrow realm. So they make this switch and you're lucky that Head has built skis for you that fit the new rules. So I think you get a little bit of a head start on skiing on the skis. And I think while it might not be as fun, it sounds like that early on in your career when you were playing around with angles on the carving skis when you're like 15 years old, and you figured out your patented cartoon turn, like all of that stuff really played into making you ski better with these new skis. Did you realize right away that this is going to be an advantage for you being on the new skis? Honestly, it was like, since we knew the rules coming, I spent a whole year before actually even came out. So like in the midst of like the 2011, 12 year, I was regularly skiing on the next year's skis to be able to just keep tinkering with them. Like, I don't know how many variations we made over that winter, which is the year before. So we were like really testing a ton. In the middle of that season, I started to be faster on the 35 meter skis than my like skis I was skiing on a regular basis. And that was kind of like an eye opener. I was like, ooh, this is my workout well. And yeah, like my technique of like skiing a cleaner, slightly rounder line, having higher edge angles ended up matching very, very well for the skis. So that summer leading into that 2012 13 year, which was the first year of the new skis, I was like, oh, I am starting to enter another level. Like it's matching up well with my skiing. And we are like nailing all these little tricks on like how to make these skis turn actually almost as well as the other skis, but then they're way better on like modern flats as well. So, you know, we had like started tinkering with equipment to the point where like we knew nobody else was going to figure these couple of pieces out for a little while. So you have an unfair advantage, not an unfair, but you have an early advantage on that thanks to your sponsor and thanks to the way you skied when you were 15. And Fist said the change is all about safety and they claim that they had science backing this up. Do you eventually call bullshit on this? Like, hey, there's nothing more safe about these skis. Instantly from like my first, I like wrote a blog post, like a tirade on the whole things. And the whole initial piece was like, I'm not a statistician, but I know 12 mediocre athletes over five days you're not getting any injury data that's meaningful or like for stat or any you're not getting anything that actually means anything so to make a rule change on a handful of days of skiing with mediocre skiers it's just laughable so they were like contorting the rule to say it was like science and evidence-based which is just a bald-faced lie so that was like a big part of why we were pissed and then like you ski on like you could hook an edge and blow out your knee just as easily like that didn't change anything at all and actually in some regards i think it led to a lot more chronic pain on the back side of things i mean part of like what wound down my career was my back injuries but if you talk to anybody who's 30 years old in ski racing especially that went through that era like all of our backs are jacked in a bad spot so i think they probably played a role in hurting people on the chronic sense And equally on the acute sense, like to blow out your knee was exactly the same. The stats didn't change in the five years before the five years after. So nothing changed there. It was just the law of unintended consequences. You start forcing a rule in one place and you don't know what it really means until years and years later. Thinking about it, it's like, are skiers out there suing fists because of the ski requirements that they're, they're forced to ski on? Or are they just making this change based on they feel like making a change? Yeah, the athlete side of things, we have no real recourse. You like kind of waive your liability with FIST when you get your FIST license. So not much there. Actually, Head did sue FIST because we'd developed a handful of different models, but we developed a model that had kind of like, not a fish tail, but like a reverse side cut tail. So like the effective side cut was actually quite a bit shorter. And that was like legal and how they like wrote the rules and that was like what I would have been racing on. And then they changed the rule specifically to make that ski illegal three weeks before the first race of the year and sold them. So that was like what our main skis were probably going to go on, even though we had some other skis that I ended up racing on that obviously worked out very, very well. But Head did sue and they did win on that too, on the rule change there because it was so late in the game. 
did Fis ever admit their mistake or they just kind of take a silent position after that? Yeah, they, I think there is a silent. I think they admitted their mistake in the sense that six years later, seven years later, they changed the rules halfway back to what they were before. So in some senses, yeah, they realized that it wasn't giving the intended consequence. This is a season where you won races by an incredible margin, huge margins. The big part of your dominance was the rule change as well. So is it almost like you're laughing all the way to the bank? It's like you idiots changed the sport and it favored me? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, especially like in some senses, like I've been pretty dominant in Giant Slam for the two years before the rule changes. So it felt a little bit like it was targeting me, especially because it was the head of the Austrian Ski Federation that was pushing the rule changes. So it felt semi-targeted when they made the rule changes. So to have the rule changes come about and be dominant. Yeah, it was entertaining. To come through the finish line sold and winning by 2.7 seconds was the best, I guess, revenge. <laughs> I mean, that's that's like a, a laughable margin of victory right there. They have to realize they did something wrong when someone's coming through the finish line with that big of a margin. I mean, you don't see that very much ever. So that's pretty incredible. And that season, you dominate. You win your fourth World Cup season title in GS. And at World Championships, you take three gold medals. And that's something that hadn't been done in like 45 years. And I believe going into it, you're out of contention for the overall title. So how does everything line up for you to do so well at Worlds? Yeah, I'd been having a great year. I was on the podium. In, or I guess I was on the podium in Super G at that point, but I had had been fourth place a bunch of times. Obviously, my giant slalom was going well. And I was actually skiing pretty decent slalom, too. So I knew I had like good chances. And Felix asked in the inappropriate questions about me being drunk in Kitzbühel. And I was likely going to... I was two gates from the finish line in the downhill. I like got late and pulled out and missed a turn instead of like risking it to finish. And if I had been on the podium there, I would have probably stayed in contention for the overall. So I was like two weekends in a row where the weekend before in Bank and my binding fell off my ski two gates from the finish line. And I was going to be second there. So I just washed away, you know, 180 to 200 points in two weekends. And that was the difference between being in contention still and not out of contention. So I like knew kind of like the season for the overall was over at that point. But then I just, yeah, blew off in steam and then refocused. I took a few days off and then came into Schladming, which I knew like on the Super G Hill, it was like a very technical hill, like almost no gliding. So I was like, this works out really well for me because it was more of a GS skiers type hill. So I knew I had chances and I was like skiing with a ton of confidence three gold medals is obviously more than I was expecting. (laughs) I mean, it's something, like I said, hadn't been done in 45 years. And when you're in Europe and you do something like that, that no one's done in forever, and you looked at as like this godlike ski racer, you're on the cover of every newspaper and lead of every TV story. Yeah, it was funny, like seeing all the newspapers in Austria, then like Koenig was King of Schladming, like was all like the newspaper stories. Yeah, it was wild. I mean, at that point, I had been having a lot of success. It wasn't like I was out of nowhere and I'd like been well established and was well known that year. But that was definitely like wild. I mean, I think actually it's kind of funny because I had won the Super G and I won the combined leading up to the GS. And so I actually didn't know that there was like any record to be had leading into the GS. But I knew also like if I didn't win the GS, I'd be kind of a failure at that point because I'd been so dominant. So I'm glad I didn't know about any records leading to the GS because I had enough pressure on myself um, going to that, just trying to live up to the expectations of the year. So you're able to win that, and that's a huge thing. You come home to a huge celebration in Park City. Is that the biggest celebration you have as like a big parade for you in Park City, or is there something bigger that I'm missing? Yeah, like coming back from World Champs that year in Park City was amazing. We had a big parade, which is like cool. Like, Park City is really amazing as far as like supporting their athletes, but there's so many of them that it's very rare to like celebrate just a single one of them because we generally celebrate all of them after Olympics and stuff like that. So that was pretty neat to be able to see that. Stein Erickson, who was like a legend in the sport, but also in Park City, who I'd grown up watching skiing at Deer Valley, like gave a really nice speech. And so it was very cool to see, you know, the city come out for that. Yeah, it's pretty rad. And you're known for being Ted Shred, the quiet champion. But going into the Olympics in Sochi, it's almost like the media tried to pitch you against Bodhi for like this big showdown in Russia. And in reality, was Bodhi pretty much a mentor for you in the early days on the team? 
Yeah, before I made the ski team in my late teens, Bodie was like favorite racer far and away. So he was definitely an idol of mine. And then coming on the team, I mean, I had other guys who were more like involved in mentoring ship wise, but I learned a ton from Bodie. I mean, I was always picking Bodie's brain. And if anybody knows Bodie, Bodie, if you ask him a question, will give you a lot to think about. So he's hugely influential. And I think like also like as part of like why I looked up to Bodie earlier on was that like he did things differently. And that like also kind of gave me permission to like do things in my own terms as well. So I think I was hugely appreciative of the role he played. Obviously the two of us are very competitive and very competitive against each other. So we both were teammates and we helped each other, but we also took a lot of joy in beating each other. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you two, you not only ski different, but the way you guys handled media was different too. So Bodie was like the bad boy, the one who was always going to give a good sound bite, And you were just Ted. Did that ever bother you that he got so much more attention compared to you? Or were you cool with that? I was fine with that. I mean, how are you going to compete with that? <laughs> you know, like, yes, he gives a better sound bite and he was dominant. Like, I mean, he won a lot more races than I did. So, I mean, I was, yes, in that shadow, but at the same time, I mean, I think that gave me some breathing room in some senses and also like, yeah, I mean, he has a very unique story. I'm not going to compete with that. So yeah, I was totally fine with that. And it doesn't seem like it's your style of being out front and center with the media. It's kind of like you've always let your skiing talk for itself. And when you need to stand out, you make some hot pink goggles or something like that, where <laughs> Bodie's the soundbite dude who's talking about what he did at the bar or wherever. And it's something that's celebrated and it kind of gives him a different level of celebrity. But you're cool with just being Ted. Yeah, I was true to myself. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there was never even a hint of, I think, animosity attention wise i mean it's just like that would have been silly on my part because it wasn't an area where i could compete with him <laughs> okay so going into the games while everyone's making a big deal about Bodie because he's Bodie and he's skiing better than he had in a long time but in thinking about you between what happened in vancouver the rule changes you being on new skis and you coming into the olympics just crushing it do you come into sochi with more confidence than you've had in forever Coming into Sochi, yeah, winning those three gold medals, the world champs the year before, you know, I went from being like a favorite in Vancouver and just nobody in Torino to being like a lot of ways, like one of the couple faces of those games. Like I was in a ton of commercials leading up to it. So in Vancouver, there was some hype, but it wasn't anywhere close to the same level of hype there was going into Sochi. So definitely a lot more pressure in that regard. I mean, it's like funny when you're like in the middle of the whole Olympic hype machine you do feel a little, a little bit more and you definitely get pulled in a lot more directions and your time becomes thinner and all that stuff. So it's a different beast for sure. And also like I had expectations to try to win three medals there. I mean, I didn't think like three gold medals was a realistic goal, but I definitely knew I had a lot of good chances and totally different pressure situation in between all those games. Yeah, I would think when Sochi, there's a lot of stories being written about you and there's a lot of pressure, like you said, and are you aware of everything that's being said? Are you reading the stories about you and kind of buying into your own press at that point? I mean, some like, yeah, sometimes you like have some curiosity. You want to see what's being read about I me. Mean, I wasn't like going out of my way and like seeking all of it out. So after the Super G, I was like also like kind of similar story as Vancouver, like on track to win a medal. I was like winning at the second glass split and made a huge mistake ended up like 15th there. I was like 50th in that middle split and then was like second on the bottom. So like outside of one stretch, I would have probably gotten a medal there. So like disappointing in the sense of like, I didn't win a medal, but also I was like happy. And it was like kind of a confidence booster. Like, no, you're seeing that well on that hill. And then in the combined, I did like a total redo of Vancouver. Like I just like overthought about it and skied horrible, especially in the Salon leg. ended up 12th. And so like at that day, I like read a couple of, stories ripping on what I just did while I was with my wife and she's like why are you reading that shit and I was like you're right I'm not going to read anything else the rest of the time then coming into the GS very very nervous but also like confident in my game plan we'd actually trained on that hill nobody had ever raced on that hill in Giant Slalom before but the U.S. team we'd gone there a couple times over the years before and trained on it and so I knew the hill really well and it was like not a technically difficult hill but it had some like tactical challenges i had a couple like really sharp rollovers onto long flats so you had to like nail those 
in training that like when you took a lot of risk, it didn't end up rewarding over those sharp breakovers. So I remember in the first run, like coming in the first breakover is called Bear's Brow and feeling like I almost did like a hockey stop coming over the roll. So I wouldn't catch air so I could like juice the next three steep gates onto the flats. And I was like, ooh, I think I overdid it there and came to the finish line and ended up winning the first run by over a second. So it worked out and that was like a huge sigh relief. Like, okay, the game plan works today and I'm skiing well today and instantly had a ton of confidence. But like in between runs, my coach who was standing on that role, he's like, I thought you overdid it there, but then it worked. <laughs> so that was a huge confidence booster. So going into like the second round of the GS, I kind of knew like I, in ski racing, nothing is ever done, but I, I felt like I had it in the bag. I felt like I had everything lined up to win you know, having a big margin and the second one ended up being like gnarly. I had a few uh, really close calls on going out. When I'm confident like that, I don't like to get too much information from the coaches on the side of the hill. Like I had a good game plan. So I actually didn't know that it was as nasty and bumpy as it was. And so I had a couple close calls slamming into some ruts, but was able to make it through and to cross that finish line and to see the green light, knowing you just won, it was like, in Torino, it was like elation and like shock, and you couldn't believe what just happened. In Sochi, it was like a whoosh of relief. Like, whew, you're super psyched, happy that it happened, but also like, I felt like a huge weight was lifted off my shoulders. That's incredible, because that was going to be my question, was like, when you win the first one, it shocks the world, but when you win the second one, it's got to be a relief, because you didn't get it in Vancouver, and people are probably questioning you, like, he did it eight years ago. Can he do it again? And you're able to do it again. You get that relief of a feeling. And this time when you win the gold medal, do you take everything all in a lot more than you did in Torino, where when it was so new and everything was just a whirlwind of everything? Are you able to appreciate this a little bit more? Yeah, I think so. I mean, as a lot older, more mature and kind of like recognize what it all meant. So yeah, I guess I did appreciate it more. Like I said, it was like a relief. The whole experience wasn't a surprise that time around, but it's a really like cool feeling to like have all this pressure and have it all pent up and then to like go and do it. It's a different sense of joy than like when something like that happens as a surprise. And it's maybe not as bubbly high as when it happens as a surprise, but it's deeper sense of like joy and accomplishment, I guess. Well, it's like you believe in yourself and you know what's possible and it's, you're proving it to yourself as well. Yeah, exactly. So the next season you do okay compared to the past few seasons. You win the world championship in GS. And then the next couple of years are all about injuries. You do an ACL. You have a major back surgery. Those are both serious injuries for a skier. And some people, especially at your age at that point, may throw in the towel. Is retirement even a thought in 2016 or is it like one more Olympics? No, I was definitely planning on going to the next Olympics. I was 30, I guess, or 31 that age, which was like at that point, which isn't really considered like old. I mean, it's like in the later throws of a career, but like the average World Cup winner is 29 or 30 years old. So it wasn't like I felt like I was past my prime, but yeah, body started breaking down. And maybe if I like had stayed healthy throughout those years and like had more success, maybe I would have been more inclined to call it quits earlier, but because I like, I kept feeling like I kept getting short changed with injury after injury that I felt like I still like wanted to get more of that taste of winning. And my body wasn't very agreeable with that. <laughs> <laughs> you do make the Olympic team. You're 33 years old. You don't medal in Pion Chang. And I don't ever say that right. And that's okay with me. Those people probably won't like it, but I guarantee they won't listen to the podcast. So what was going on around that Olympics? Is there a reason behind your performance there? I mean, I was like fifth in the combined. So I was actually close to like getting a medal in combined. And in GS, I was skiing well, be like I was in the podium the race before, but like just I was not confident on my skis. Yeah, I just wasn't skiing in a place where I felt like I could push hard. The core sets were super straight, which never really agreed with me. And I didn't ski well. I was immensely disappointed after the GS. I was 15th, but also like in a sense, lost it wasn't like i had gone down and had the best race ever and was 15th but i also didn't like have the worst race ever and it was 15th i just was slow i just wasn't good and so yeah that was disappointing big 
nothing was particularly wrong. I just don't have it. Is that like forever or is that just today? So that was that was tough. That Olympics didn't work out for you and you do continue to race for a couple of years, but you formally retire in 2021. And I'm sure there's a ton of different reasons for you. I'm sure it's like family, business, your body, maybe racing so much for 15 years has kind of burnt you out. But at the end of the day, is it just time? Like you're still an incredible skier, but the next generation is just faster. Yeah. I mean, like leading up to retiring is when I, my wife and I had our first kid, Jax, he traveled the world with us the first two years. So he'd gone to like 13 countries by the time he was one. And so like that lifestyle worked. But then he was becoming older, so it was harder for him to travel. And then we had twins the year before I retired. It just was impossible for them to travel. And so I wasn't, like, really willing to, like, do the long trips. So I was generally doing 10 days in Europe, 10 days at home, like, going back and forth. And that wasn't leading to the skiing that really needed to be done. And also, like, my body wasn't in a good spot. So halfway through the year, like, I'd been motivated. I was, like training hard all summer. I mean, it was also like through COVID. So training was a little funky and all that stuff, but I felt like I had a good chance, but it was hard. I think I was like, wanted to compete at a high level, but also didn't want to be away from the family. And if I couldn't be competing at a high level and I was sitting on the road, getting 20 something plays, I didn't feel like I was doing anything productive. So I decided like halfway through the year that world champs to be my last race came home prepared for world champs knowing that that was going to be the last two raw and then went over to Europe and trained for a couple of days in the back fully went out on me and couldn't end up racing the final, final race came home and had surgery. So it kind of was like a anti climatic into it all. But yeah, it wasn't like one singular factor that, you know, led there. It was all the culmination. Well, I guess one single factor led me not to race my last race, <laughs> which was my back, but the culmination of just, yeah, not being able to commit at the level I wanted to, but also I'm not wanting to be able to like go on the road as long as it was required, you know, wanting to come home to the family was, was becoming more and more important. So yeah, just none of those things could square. That's amazing how important children are and how they will make you alter what you thought was the most important part of your life to be with them more if they can't travel with you. So totally understandable why you retired. Is it a challenge to get back into regular society, not being Ted the racer? Was that transition difficult? Honestly, I think like having kids makes that transition a lot smoother. Because you don't have any time to think about it? Yeah, like friends I have that have retired that didn't have kids, I think I've seen a lot of them lost and not like sure where and what to do. And I think that's a harder transition. Yeah, when you have kids, like you get home and like they don't really care no the difference and i mean three boys is <laughs> your house is pretty chaotic there's not like a lot of downtime and i was lucky to like have the career i had so i still like do a lot of the same stuff i was doing when i was racing i just don't spend any time between the gates so the transition like in a lot of ways was easier like i still like to guess have the itch to race here and there and like when i see a race and the conditions are awesome like ooh, i kind of wish i was out there but when i see a race and the conditions are normal to nasty. I'm like, oh, thank God I'm not racing. (laughs) Gotcha. All right. So that is our podcast. And you know what time it is now. It's time for inappropriate questions. And this week I wasn't able to get anyone else. And believe me, I tried. I tried coaches. I tried other racers. I tried current racers, but it didn't happen. So I'm going to ask the inappropriate questions. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah. And my first one is (laughs) about cheating. And how do you deal with a person that gets caught for doping? In alpine skiing, luckily, I don't think doping was a big issue. I think there's a lot of things that are happening in the gray area, which is like basically taking drugs that are illegal unless you have a doctor's prescription. So I think like in Europe, that side of the system is gamed a lot more, but it's not like cross country skiing or cycling where like doping definitely makes all the difference. Now, fine. I think there's some stuff that happens here and there, but it's not as field tilting as some other sports. Okay, so you don't feel like people are really, like, cheating? No, I think there are some people that have therapeutic use exemptions for Adderall and all that stuff that don't necessarily, they shouldn't be having it, even though that's a huge advantage, being able to, like, go on those types of drugs. If you're in a sport that needs to be concentrated for two minutes, 
I think a lot of people are gaming it in that regard. And some countries are more willing to write those descriptions and do that paperwork than we are in the U.S. So that's like annoying if you kind of like know some guys are playing that game. But yeah, I don't think it's something that's like super prevalent. I'd be super annoyed if I was a cross-country skier and knowing you're going up against a bunch of doped up Russians. But I don't think that's the case in ski racing. Okay. So I will go into my second inappropriate question. This is more Powell movement specific. And okay. have you ever pooped your pants while skiing? I never pooped my pants when I was skiing, no. I went far and pooped my pants in high school. <laughs> Shard? <laughs> but never, <laughs> but never, never in a ski suit, luckily. All right. So you won on that one. That's a good thing. Your <laughs> final inappropriate question. In 2011, there was a U.S. ski teamer who peed on a person on a flight. What happens behind the scenes when something like that goes down? And what's the worst you've ever seen or heard of a U.S. ski teamer doing? Yeah, that was an unfortunate mix of somebody on our team. Yeah, a little bit of alcohol and some ambient and not knowing where he was. <laughs> but yeah, the worst I've ever seen, seen or heard done. Oh, man. I mean, that was probably like the most potentially damaging situation like for somebody. But yeah, not like in like the absurdity sense, but we always drive really fast in Europe and we always generally have fast cars there. So that is, I think, the biggest potential. I mean, I remember like Bodie and I, when we were both sponsored by Audi, we both had our like RS6s and like going 120 miles an hour up the glacier road up to Solden. Stuff can go pretty wrong in that regard. <laughs> Do you ever have any issues with one of your loaner Audis ever ding anything up? No, like, major damage, just, like, I mess up some rims hitting, like, curbs going too fast in Europe. Like, you know, all those, like, mountain roads will have to often have, like, a little curb, so no major da- Actually, I didn't flip it. Well, one of the guys on the team flipped my <laughs> car. Well, no major damage. What? Wait, I didn't flip it. I wasn't in the driver's seat, but it was my car, so that was the worst of it. It was, like, a snowy road, and so we were, like, rallying it, doing donuts and, like, drifting turns, and he went into turn too fast and we flipped it it was the day before a race too huh. so that was less than ideal but we were totally fine it wasn't something that we were injured or anything it was just a, a nuisance having to get a tow truck to unflip your car and take it into the shop <laughs> i mean i would think it's got to be nerve-wracking when you have to call audi and say hey you know that loaner vehicle you gave us well we had it towed and we flipped it can we get a different vehicle yeah pretty much yeah that wasn't a super enjoyable conversation <laughs> All right, so that's inappropriate questions, and that's the podcast. And looking at your life and times, it's amazing you even became a ski racer. I mean, you had no family connection to the sport. You found it on your own, and you sucked for a while. And it's a totally <laughs> different experience than like almost anyone who's ever on this podcast. But the common denominator is your work ethic. And while we didn't talk about it that much on this podcast, it sounds like the way that you outworked and out hustled everyone all the time is what the big separator was. And then when you grew into your body, it was game over for the competition. And it's a good lesson for the kid who hits puberty late or whose parents didn't hold him back. It's like, hey, kid, you can make it. But your body, like a pair of kids ski boots, is something that you're going to have to grow into. And you did it. And you are on top of the biggest podiums in the world twice. It's a great story. And I thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you very much. This is fun. So that was part two with Ted Ligeti. And what a champion that guy is. Absolutely zero ego when he could have a ton. I mean, the guy has two Olympic gold medals and he's killed it on the World Cup. Ted's story is one all about hard work, waiting to mature, and then maximizing his potential. But the coolest part to me about this episode is how Ted told Fiss, even though the new rules favored them, that their rule change was wrong. I love it when an athlete sticks it to the sports controlling, corrupt governing body. And that's exactly what Ted did. And eventually, things reversed itself, and Ligeti got the last laugh. That's the podcast. At this point, I want to thank you for listening and ask you to support my incredible sponsors who make this thing happen. They are Elon Skis, Rollerblade, Stanley, Best Day Brewing, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, and High Cascade Snowboard Camp. Have a great week, everyone. <laughs>